My name is Julie Pearson Littlefender. Today is Thursday, October 14th, and I'm here with Benjamin Harjo in his studio in Oklahoma City. Good afternoon, Ben. Good afternoon, Julie. Um, what are your tribal affiliations? I am Absentee Shawnee and Seminole. And can you tell me where you were born? Yes, I can, but I don't think I want to. Okay, I'll tell you. I was born in Clovis, New Mexico. Uh -huh. In 1945, September the 19th. And that's where you attended school? <clears throat> no, that's just where I was born. <laughs> uh, we came to Oklahoma because uh, both my parents are from Oklahoma. And I started school in Bing High School, or Bing Grade School, in uh, Bing, Oklahoma, which was a small community outside of Ada, Oklahoma. And I attended first grade there, and then um, my mom and I moved to back to Clovis, and I attended school there at various schools until about the fifth grade when we moved back to Oklahoma. So we were kind of nomadic at that beginning of my life, and then I went back into being Oklahoma uh, to their school. See, um, did your parents meet in a, in a Clovis by chance, or did they meet in Oklahoma? Boy, I think they met at probably a bar in some off location somewhere. I, I'm not really sure where they met because they've never really talked, and we've never asked them where they met. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, my dad was in service uh, because of the war then, and. Uh, my mom was working, uh, doing um, probably uh, aircraft maintenance, stuff like that. There was the Air Force Base there, wasn't there? At the well, at that time, there were a lot of uh, people that had moved out to California to go to work because of the war efforts there. And uh, it was much later. Uh, my older brother was born in Sacramento, California, and my younger brother and I were born in Clovis, New Mexico. So we kind of did a lot of moving around. And I remember after my dad got out of service, we went uh, up and down the coast of California, Oregon, and, um, Washington State, mm. picking fruit and nuts and whatever, you know, because it, it was still, uh, uh, I think, uh, a depression type economy uh, going on and work was finding wherever it was, uh, whether it was a cotton fields picking cotton or out in the orchards. Right. Um, <clears throat> I do remember you talking a little bit about f managing to find some spare change for two of your favorite loves when you were young. What were, what were those? <laughs> well, when we, uh, my mom and I were living in Clovis before my uh, brothers came and joined us, um, I would go to the Western Movies, which was just down from where my mom and I lived. And in order to finance going to these movies to see uh, Roy Rogers or Gene Autry or Johnny Mac Brown or Lash LaRue, who was a uh, Oklahoman, um, I would get pop bottles. And I think they were two cents a piece to turn in. So I'd get enough to go to the movies at five cents at that time, which <laughs> was the cost of admission. And sometimes I'd be there watching the same movie three or four times until it finally occurred to me that that was going to be the ending of it. <laughs> Do you remember um, any of your early art efforts in, in school? <clears throat> um, I was always attracted to reading comics and uh, sketching. Uh, some of the Looney Tune and uh, Walt Disney characters and enjoyed that and uh, fascinated with uh, Walt Kelly and uh, of course uh, Steve Canyon and Milton Caniff and uh, Dick Tracy, uh, Chester Gould. Wow. Some of the people that uh, I thought, well, I think I, I'd like to be a cartoonist when I grew up. Yes, those are more sophisticated cartoons, <laughs> a lot of reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, of course Pogo was very uh, politically oriented <laughs> at that time. 
uh, I was sort of curious um, <clears throat> when you went to live with your grandparents. How how did that come about? But, well, um, the reason my mom and I moved to Clovis is that uh, my dad and she had gotten divorced, and she took me and my dad took my two uh, brothers, and then they finally came out and joined us in Clovis, and then she remarried, and that's when we moved back to Oklahoma, and she gave us a choice of did we want to live with her or did we want to go live with our grandparents, and all three of us uh, chose our grandparents. Cause and uh, we didn't want to break up the unit. And also, I know that uh, <clears throat> Indian kids frequently are given that choice because it's sort of an opportunity to be raised a little more traditional. But yeah, not only that, but it was a more stable, uh, I think, environment. Uh, my my mom eventually uh, gave birth to our sister, um, but they they too were. Uh, a young family and we're moving around going to different areas and uh, I think uh, being with our grandparents of course there were three cousins already living there so mm -hmm. that made a household of uh, eight people one bathroom one wow. uh, but it was a farm and uh, we raised uh, cows and pigs and chickens and so we didn't have to go to the grocery store for those products, you know, right. the eggs and the, the meat, um, but it was a, a labor um, intensive environment as well. Right. As, uh, once we increased the family, we had to do two gardens. So it was our <laughs> job to go out and hoe and weed and make sure that we picked everything when it grew ripe. Wow. I think you were 17 or 18, is that right, when you headed out to the to the art school, the Institute of American Indian uh, Art in Santa Fe? I was a ripe old age of 18 by then because <laughs> I was held back a year uh, from my first grade, so I had to do it twice. And <laughs> after that, I think I learned I better stay on top of things. <laughs> what um, drew you to the Institute? <clears throat> I was sitting in the uh, Shawnee Indian Clinic, IHS uh, waiting to get some annual shots and I picked up a bulletin and in the bulletin I read that Santa Fe had begun a school called the Institute of American Indian Arts at that time and in reading the description of the classes they offered I saw a class in cartooning. So I told my grandmother that's where I wanted to go to school. Um, my uh, high school counselor wasn't too excited about that because they were grooming <laughs> me to go to college. And my older brother was the brain, so they figured I must be right behind him, and of course I wasn't the brain. He was. <laughs> I but I was more creative. <laughs> <laughs> so we made the application, and uh, I worked for the summer in Tulsa at a bottling company, and then packed my bags, and off I went to Santa Fe. And when I got there, I discovered that they had no longer had the class in cartooning. And I figured as long as I was there, I may as well enroll in the other courses. So I started out with painting and drawing and color and design and pottery and um, discovered a, a wonderful instructor there named Seymour Tubas. And at that time, they had some great teachers. Um, uh, Alan Hauser was in the um, sculpture department as well as painting, and Fritz Shoulder was painting. Um, uh, Charles Lolima was doing jewelry, and Otley was doing pottery. And uh, Seymour Tubas, who became my mentor, a mentor, um, he taught uh, not only drawing, painting, but he also taught woodblock printmaking or printmaking in general. And it was a uh, method of working that uh, was new to me. I'd never known what it was all about until I did my first uh, wood block and cut out the same areas in both blocks and got yelled at severely. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> they enrolled me in pottery and. Uh, I sat there for a whole class period with this piece of clay, and I think I ended up making an ashtray. Uh, 
So many people did. <laughs> so I, I left that classroom the next time it met and they were looking for me and discovered that I was in the printmaking room and they decided that they would leave me alone because if that's what I wanted to study then uh, they wouldn't interfere, which was, which was good. Going there, um, it was a two-year postgraduate uh, learning experience for me because at that time they did not have a, a degree program. And so it was kind of an interim between uh, high school and college or the university. That sounds like one of the reasons it, it was such a successful program. I mean, it produced an amazing number of uh, really prominent artists. Are there some other aspects of the program, you think, that really made it successful? I think there were a lot of aspects of the Institute that made it very successful because uh, when I first started there, we had around 300 students, and the students came from everywhere in the United States, um, Alaska, um, and all the other uh, tribal identities that came there, and I hadn't realized how many there were until I went to school there. And we had an, um, our own uh, aesthetics day. And uh, Lewis Ballard, who is also an Oklahoman, was a great uh, composer, right. um, was our aesthetics instructor at that time. And we were grouped into to divisions, um, the five tribes uh, under Lewis Ballard. Um, we were taught some music and we were uh, taught dance. And uh, then at the end of the school year, we got together and each of us prepared uh, a mill um, and built a structure from the various tribal groups there. Uh, and ours was a chicky. And uh, then we all got together uh, in the evening and everybody got to go around and try other foods. Um, but that, that was a, a good part of it too. Is, as well as being at the Institute and taking field trips, being exposed to um, a lot of uh, other artists and their works, going out um, and sketching uh, the landscape, whether it's along the Rio Grande or up at the Pueblo, uh, attending some of their uh, ceremonies. And uh, I think it was very enjoyable because we lived on campus we uh, were like a, a, a clique of creative energy and uh, it kind of emanated from there. Like you said, uh, a lot of great artists emerged out of those uh, years in 60, 64 and 66. Uh, and a lot of them went on to make uh, names for themselves. Who were some of the your fellow Oklahomans over there? Uh, fellow Oklahomans that I can name right off the bat was uh, Sherman Chattelson, uh, T.C. Cannon, um, Kirby Feathers, um, and uh, Burt Russell, um, Patty Harjo, no relation, but uh, a very good friend, um, and uh, a fellow named Silverhorn. And, uh, mm. but uh, some of these guys went on to pursue a career in the arts and others found uh, that art was not the easiest career to make a living <laughs> at. But you had to have kind of a hard shell and bullheadedness. <laughs> and uh, I think that was me from the beginning because there were several times my dad tried to talk me out of going to be an artist. He said, you won't make a living at it. And I think uh, before he passed on, he realized that, yes, I, I was so bullheaded that I was going to make a living at it. <laughs> Thank you for that story. Um, you went to Vietnam. I did, yeah. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Oh no, I went kicking and screaming like all the rest of the guys at that period. But uh, um, when I got drafted, uh, I had run out of my student deferments and so I knew I was going and I hung around Stillwater 
waiting for the official notice. And then when it came, uh, went to Fort Polk for my uh, basic training, and then Fort Sill. Um, and I figured, well, if I'm going to Vietnam, I'm going to go um, and enlist in their program for a non-commissioned officer as a sergeant. So I went over as a, a gunnery sergeant uh, on the 175 uh, field artillery. Mm. Good idea. Um, so basically it was after you had enrolled at OSU that you were drafted, is that correct? Oh, or? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, w okay. I wasn't headed to college until Seymour told me this is your option. You're going to college. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's an it's a, <clears throat> a it's an interesting uh, because you know some of the students, of course, were coming out and they were going for that career full force, um, but you chose to get a university education too. Well, there were a, a lot of students that went on. Um, some of them went to the Chicago Arts Institute, or they went to the San Francisco Art Institute uh, to pursue uh, more education because, like I say, it was it was Just, basics right, that we year. learned there. And uh, I remember going to uh, OSU and uh, meeting J.J. McVicker for the first time. And, I told him that I didn't think his art department was up to snuff. Yes. And I had no idea who he was at that time. <clears throat> and he turned to me and he said, well, uh, we're not uh, exactly an art school. But, uh, he knew I'd come fresh out of an art school. And, right. Uh, <laughs> Is there a way in which you think having to go to Vietnam um, impacted your artwork? Um, I don't. I don't think it impacted my artwork. It was a break because uh, when I was drafted at that point in my life, it was kind of a low moment, mm. and uh, it provided me with clothes, with uh, three square meals a day. Of course, it was also a learning disciplinary uh, environment again, and. Uh, um, since I knew I was headed that way, my older brother was at Fort Sill and was stationed there because uh, he was uh, in Officer Candidate School and uh, at that time they had too many officers so that's where he stayed. And my younger brother went in the Marines and he was stationed in Okinawa and he kept volunteering to go to Vietnam so I wouldn't have to go. But I think I probably would have went anyway even if he had gotten <laughs> to go over to Vietnam. Um, some uh, good experiences, some good people I met there, um, beautiful country, uh, but I felt like uh, we were people, and in my view, looking at Indian people, uh, because the Vietnamese right. uh, had that impression on me, that here we were with uh, military might, firepower. And here these guys were determined not to be overtaken, uh, to be ruled. Sort of a colonial. Yeah. Back yeah. In, yes. Um. Yeah, and I, you know, I'd written a paper uh, when I was at OSU that we were not going to win the war in Vietnam, and one of the fellows that was in uh, ROTC had questioned why we weren't and I laid out why we weren't, and the determination of the people uh, was a major factor. And you were correct, right. <laughs> so many people would say. <clears throat> I was wondering, um, when you got back and you um, were in Tulsa, and I understand you were one of the first Indian artists to visit Linda Griever, who had just opened the art market. And she had inherited these Impressionist paintings. <laughs> but I, as I understand it, you were one of the people who first convinced her um, that maybe she should go a different direction. Do you remember some of those early conversations with Linda? Oh, sure. Sure. You know, along the way, uh, I graduated out of Oklahoma State University in 1974. 
with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Oh, and so you came back moved after to, the war yeah, finished. Yeah, I, I uh, spent about a year and a half bumming around, figuring out what did I want to do, and the GI Bill was uh, then um, available to me. Right. So I took advantage of it and finished my degree at uh, Oklahoma State. And then once I was out of there, moved to Tulsa and worked for the Tulsa Indian Youth Council for two years as their cultural and recreational coordinator. Of course, before I got that job, I was a janitor until she found that I had a degree. Yes, <laughs> and, I remember uh, TIYC. <clears throat> then uh, I kept reading uh, in the magazines about some of my fellow uh, classmates and uh, what they were doing with their art. And I decided it was time to jump off and begin my career more seriously than I had in the past. Of course, uh, all throughout going uh, from uh, Santa Fe uh, to college, um, I continued to do woodblock printmaking. And I would do that after classes and in my spare time and um, working uh, with a um, frame shop in an uh, art supply store there in Stillwater. I could get my art supplies at a discount. And I learned how to do framing and matting and cutting glass, which was something that every painter, every artist needs to take advantage of, that uh, when they find some place they want to work at, do it in the art field that uh, they're concentrating on, whether it's dance or music or, or whatever. You know. Yeah, I can see the utility of that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, um, Do you still frame <coughs> some of your own pieces? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That way I know where Touch. it is. <laughs> 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 and if I'm working till the deadline of a show, I'm, I can seal mat and frame and, and do all of that uh, right before the show. Um, but yeah, um, I would travel from door to door sometimes for businesses and show them my portfolio of work I had and uh, I told them you don't have to buy anything but if you'd like to look and uh, that was my way of getting in the door and of course most of the time they found something someone wanted and they would end up buying it. Um, but walking into uh, the art market at that time, um, she was doing shows with a, a Cherokee artist named E.G. Thompson. And uh, I think he was uh, probably the first that she worked with. And he would uh, have, the, I think, the whole gallery at that point. Um, and she had a lot of the starving artist paintings that she was selling, you know, the mass-produced things from uh, the Europe, um, uh, Orient, or from these uh, houses that did the paintings. And, um, <clears throat> I talked to her and I said, uh, why don't you do an Indian art gallery? And she said she would talk it over with her husband, Matt Griever, at that time. And they would let me know. And sure enough, they decided, well, let's try it. So my friend Terry Adams and I, uh, Terry had worked with me and for me at the uh, uh, Tulsa Indian Youth Council. He and I got in there and we started stacking these display uh, walls that she had and uh, he was a bead worker and a feather worker and so we put his bustles on the uh, stacked columns and then we started doing art shows and uh, we would take uh, brown paper and cover the uh, glass so no one could see in until we had the opening of the show and then we would rip the paper down and people would be standing outside waiting to get in and it was a wonderful time. Uh, there was that much excitement, basically, there was that, much that you excitement. wanted to keep there it was, a secret. Uh, some artists that uh, gathered for the shows, and uh, gosh, we uh, we had uh, some great turnouts, some great shows. What um, Oklahoma shows did you do? There were some major shows at the time. I think the Philbrook Annual was... The Philbrook Annual was going on at that time, yeah. And uh, Did you ever do that show? Or? I did that show, um, usually with my woodcuts. And uh, then we had uh, mall shows, bank shows, any show we could find that we could get into because there 
were not that many available to us then. Uh, not a lot of the museums or uh, places were doing uh, Indian art shows. So. Was the Five Tribes Museum <coughs> active back then, though? Yes, they were. In terms yeah, of they were doing their show, and uh, I can't remember if I even went to do their shows or not. Is that right? Because you are one of their master artists Eventually. now, aren't you? Eventually. Oh, okay. <laughs> do you remember when you got the, when you won that? Uh, earned that title? Oh gosh, uh, I do not. In, it was in the 80s, so long ago. Yeah. When and how did you meet your wife, Barbara? Oh, uh, after a couple of marriages, uh, I met Barbara uh, at a art symposium just down the street from where we live now uh, at uh, Oklahoma City Here in University. Oklahoma City. And uh, my friend Robbie McMurtry and I were attending the symposium and exhibiting our work and we were the uh, only table that had extra seats when lunchtime rolled around and so she and her mom came over and said sat with us and of course uh, I had no idea that uh, we would get together later on we were just two rascal artist out there. That was, your first, time. that was your first meeting. <laughs> that was our first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I, you know, all artists need a kind of, you know, support system, emotional, psychological, and um, I'm just um, wondering how that has impacted your career to, to have uh, been able to meet Barbara and well, I, uh, you know, looking at, at a support system, um, going back to Tulsa, um, working with uh, D.F. Henry, uh, who had the mobile art gallery at that time. and um, um, What mobile art gallery? That's new to me. That was, that was the name of it, oh. D.F. Henry's mobile art gallery. And she was doing shows at a place called the Ramekin Restaurant. And uh, I had met Jim Halsey and Jim Halsey had talked to her about hosting a show for me at the restaurant. And Jim was... You might... Jim Halsey is a, a music promoter uh, at that time and he still, I think, um, um, handles the Oak Ridge Boys. Uh, he was with... Um, uh, um, Leon Russell, was he? I think Leon Russell and he worked together, uh, but there were a lot of people that, that he worked with and he mentored and, and uh, um, Roy Clark mm. is another one of his musicians now. Um, but when he talked to Diane, um, she paired me with um, Willard Stone for the Ramekin restaurant show. And that was my first experience with seeing that my artwork was going for more than what I had been able to sell it for because she was also a promoter of the arts. And then from um, that Had she like doubled your prices or? Uh, sometimes she tripled them or <laughs> she, made it, <laughs> she made it where the people were willing to buy it. And uh, I saw that uh, that was something that I could do um, as well. And uh, then of course along the way um, meeting uh, Doris Littrell and uh, uh, working with her um, and then Linda Griever and uh, then coming here to Oklahoma City and again working with Doris and uh, but there there have been some very supportive people along the way and I've had some very lucky breaks um, who's been able to travel and to promote my art and I think uh, always been able to be out there um, and talk with people, uh, always being friendly with them. And, and I'm not a hard sell artist. If they like my work and they want to buy it, that's great. And I really appreciate the people over the years that have uh, bought my work and been able to support me. And uh, yeah, like you say, <clears throat> it takes two. And Barb is the money manager, and she keeps the agenda of where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, I can create, and she can manage. And 
I think that's what every artist needs. <laughs> and sometimes um, there's there's that element of protecting your time too. Yeah, I know. There I is. Yeah. we have that. It's nice to have that. You know, you mentioned um, some of the learning experiences and um, how they. I'm, I'm look, thinking of how this might have fed into your art, um, your career as an artist, just the fact that you worked a little bit in the gallery for Linda, didn't mm -hmm. you, yeah, for I a did. couple of years? Well, it's still so having the it. training of, of uh, being able to cut mats and frame and things like that. And then uh, if a show came up, such as uh, going out to California and uh, doing uh, the uh, Natural History Museum shows, uh, they would help finance that sounds my fun. transportation and uh, getting me out there to yes. do these shows. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In terms of um, your painting, um, and just well, let's just talk about all the media that you love to work in right now. What what are the media that you work in? Um, Printmaking. Um, sometimes it's uh, uh, monotypes. Uh, mostly it's woodcuts, uh, occasionally it's etchings, um, then painting, whether it's using acrylics or, or gouache, um, and then drawing, which is uh, pencil, uh, pen and ink, uh, crepas, which is the oil crayon, uh, very little in the way of pastel, but then use of colored pencil, uh, Conti crayon, which is the forerunner of the pastel and comes in the sepia tones. And I've always enjoyed working with the Conti. That's a really amazing range. What is it that you like about, well, let's start with woodblock prints. What I like about woodblock, or what I like about printmaking in general, is texture. Being able to print things that have texture, whether it's a flattened frog that I found in the highway and I've glued to a board and inked up, or you know, <laughs> taking a fish, and uh, especially if I'm teaching a class to grown-ups or to kids, uh, exposing them to going, well, I didn't know a fish could be printed. <laughs> of course, you don't want to eat it after you print it, but <laughs> you can see what it looks like. And, and uh, then taking the bottoms of their tennis shoes that has a design in it, and having them do a rubbing across there and seeing that, wow, I didn't notice this. Because there's a lot that's textural around us right. that we don't see. And, and printmaking, when I discovered it, I wanted to print everything that had <laughs> some kind of texture, whether a crack in the cement or a snake that I'd found and it had gotten flat. And so I could glue it down. And one year I took eggshells. And I took an old puzzle board and I flattened the eggshells after as I glued them down and then ran my inks over it and printed it to see what it would look like. Uh, I remember telling uh, Terry uh, a long time ago about coming home from uh, a class and I'd cooked uh, some beans and the beans had spilled on the stove and when I looked at the uh, image there on the stove, I drew it down and I made it into a woodcut. And I printed that. So influences for printmaking come from everywhere. It's just up to you to see what's there. And it also so much ties into your love of, um, well, picking out the patterns and things. And I know you made a statement somewhat to this effect that, you know, you look for basically the hole in the part, that that's part of your approach to design, that you look at something very closely. And you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you look at things, I think, a little differently. Um, I've looked at bugs, and I see designs in them. Uh, one time I was drawing uh, or painting a dragonfly, and as I started painting it, uh, right in the center of the dragonfly, there emerged a woman kneeling, and I had not seen that until it came in to my painting. But uh, it was also a part of the dragonfly, and I've seen uh, spider images on the patterns of the uh, back of a turtle. Um, so yeah, uh, again, you have that different way of looking at things, and it, it will spark um, 
a drawing or it'll spark a painting and then you can go in and, and uh, draw it and then put it down uh, and then start to paint it. We're going um, back to your paintings. Um, how has your style changed over the years? Over the years, uh, my paintings and my drawings and my woodcuts have kind of all merged together into the style that I have now. When I first started, I was doing a lot of uh, photographs and drawing from those or painting from those. And uh, I wasn't real happy with the way it was going because I was getting bored. Was it a kind of hyper-realism or was it just more... Some of it was. Some representational. Of was, some of it was representational. Uh, uh, I, I enjoyed my uh, pen and inks. Um, because uh, I did one one time and um, it appeared very three-dimensional to me because it just popped the face out. It was a face on, on black background. Uh, right, and, I remember uh, those. Doing the black background, of course it was white paper, but then I brushed ink over the to make it black. But I think it was intentional for me to take my woodcuts and try to merge them into my painting style uh, as it developed and to do a lot more geometric patternings and use of uh, uh, primary colors. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about your color. Do you m mix color at all? Let's start with your gouache, your work in gouache. With my gouache, I do mix color just as I do with the acrylics and with the uh, oil-based printing inks. Uh, I think sometimes when you find that you run out of colors because there's only so many there then then you have to mix and come up with something that excites you. Yeah. Well there's one particular color that um, many people uh, admire which is it's it's not quite a blue, it's not quite a purple. You might know what shade or hue I'm thinking of and it, it seems to be present in a, in a lot of your work. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is either. <laughs> but, you know, I have no, no concept of what my color scheme is going to be. I know what kind of my drawing is going to be. And then when I sit down and I start to paint, um, my colors develop. You know, they'll come out of the tube first. And then I'll uh, hit the areas that I think I want to see the color move around on my canvas or on my board and then I'll come back in and add another color to that to see if it will react to it. And sometimes it's complementary and sometimes it's not. But uh, I just enjoy the, the, the paint and then the reaction of color on color. And is the idea to keep the eye moving in a certain way that you would like it to move or is it not even necessarily that's not a huge consideration? Uh, I th yeah, I think it is a huge consideration because I, li I like to have the eye moving and I like to, to experiment with how it moves to see where it's going to move. And that's within my own self. And right. Like I say, if the viewer likes it and if the purchaser enjoys it, then that's great. How about your painting materials? Have they changed very much um, since you started? What, in terms, do you work on board, or what, what kinds of materials do you prefer? Um, I like uh, the 300-pound watercolor paper, but then I'll use 140-pound water watercolor paper. Uh, I like the Bristol board. Uh, I like the the smooth. Uh, as opposed to the vellum because it seems like the smooth will hold a line better and not feather as much as on the vellum. Um, and I use uh, uh, pen and pen points, pen staffs and pen points that are interchangeable. Uh, I don't use a rapidiograph because uh, I think the rapidiograph is too much uh, of the same line and mm -hmm. I like a varied line. And, uh, of course, using the, the pinpoints and the staffs, you got to be real careful that you don't load it with too much ink or you get this great big blob and then you've got to figure out, okay, what can I make out of this? Those pen and inks seem like they would be very time intensive. Or... It's all time intensive, 
but after a while you forget uh, how much time is in there. Um, sometimes it's deadlines that you're worried about and so you're painting all through the night or up into the late morning hours and you're working three or four or five, six days straight to just finish something. And uh, for me, uh, doing one piece at a time. Uh, it's real hard to do several pieces because if I don't finish one piece and I've got several started sometime, I'll lose interest in the other ones. So I try to concentrate on one piece and then move to another piece. Are there certain subjects that you see sort of recurring in your paintings over and over, or themes? Um, some subjects uh, show up unintentionally. I didn't mean to put them in there, but uh, it seems like the bird image shows up quite a bit in my works. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of uh, enjoy uh, all images. Um, I'll be reading a book, uh, I'll be looking at uh, maybe, say, Mayan art or Egyptian art, and uh, w looking at a magazine, and all of a sudden in the background of a photograph will be an image that sparks my imagination, so I'll draw it down. And, and I think it's important for uh, an artist to keep a sketch pad because the ideas come at the strangest moments and if you don't write them down or sketch them down, then <laughs> you forget about them. And I've done that before. <laughs> and I'm going, what was the idea? <laughs> well, that's one thing I get very strongly um, from some of your paintings is that, um, that the continuity, a feeling of continuity of native cultures through the millennia, you know, I even remember at the wheel ride and other places, you know, paintings that specifically referred like to mound building cultures or mm -hmm. um, peoples from uh, the mound building cultures. Is there any special connection that you that you feel with with uh, those culture groups? I think looking at uh, petroglyphs. Uh, visiting some of the drawings and the paintings that they put on the cave walls, looking at the designs and patterns in their clothes and their buildings and their reputation of objects. Um, yeah, they've all had an influence on my work. Um, and I think uh, you'll see in my work that I do a lot of repeating objects a lot of times. And uh, animals have often been a subject matter. Uh -huh. And I happened to read your comment that you um, that hooves are more pleasing to draw. You like the design of hooves <laughs> more than feet. <laughs> and I was really struck by that because feet aren't that really pretty. <laughs> no, but you can make them really strange looking. <laughs> what uh, role does humor play in your work? Um, Humor, um, because I wanted to be a cartoonist, uh, sometimes plays a, a very important role in, in what I'm creating. Uh, sometimes I'll do a piece that will make me laugh. Uh, <laughs> other times it's, it's, uh, it's also has its serious side uh, on occasion, and sometimes it's a protest piece, but I don't always tell people that, because I think within me, uh, it's my protest. So it's kind of a way, humor can be a way of making people open up to a, a statement that's sort of a protest or a challenging their thinking. Is, yeah. is that yeah. what you're... Yeah. yeah. yeah I did a, a piece uh, and it was called The Times They Are Changing. I used one of Bob Dylan's titles and it was a face of an Indian person and it started out that uh, it was very dark on one side and as it progressed it got lighter and then it progressed some more and it got browner. And uh, this was uh, my statement that not all Indian people are brown and they don't all look alike. And so you have these many facets of color within the Indian races. 
How important is story to your paintings? Oh, uh, sometimes story uh, is pretty important because some of them don't have a story until I complete them, and then people want to know, okay, what is the meaning of this? Uh, some of them don't have a story, and so I'll have to make up something just to please the, the audience. <laughs> or do, do you always come up with something, or, or do you sometimes sort of Sometimes I say there's Share. really no story there's because no story. it's just a, a drawing that pleases me. But that is such an expectation, yeah. and especially yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like for the, Indian artists, that's a... It's like you have to title your work. And, and how do you feel about titles? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're pretty difficult to come up with, and other times they roll right off my, my tongue. and uh, So I always try to think of sometimes a humorous title to some of my pieces. That sounds like a good strategy. <laughs> you know, speaking of sketchbooks, I always wondered if you had like a secret sketchbook of <laughs> cartoons or something that <laughs> you're not going to reveal the existence of until <laughs> way later. <laughs> but I know that sketching is important to your creative process. It is, yeah. Um, like I say, a lot of times I'm sitting talking on the phone and uh, I'll be sketching uh, or I'm watching TV and they'll, they'll pan across this room and there's a photograph uh, or maybe even a painting in the background. And to me it'll look entirely like something else. I'll have to quickly go and sketch it down. But uh, yeah, I, I think if you don't have a sketch pad around you and you have a napkin, uh, an old envelope, Anything that you can <laughs> draw on uh, is helpful. This, this is uh, sort of out of the blue, but did you ever do a drawing in exchange for a meal? Um, I think so. Um, I've uh, gone to uh, restaurants with uh, friends, and uh, if I'm bored or if I'm sitting there and I happen to have a pen or a pencil, then I'll draw something. And of course, if I leave it, they're ripping it off the table and going, I'll pay for your meal. <laughs> <laughs> so that worked nicely. <laughs> do you do a certain amount of um, printing each year? How do you know when you're ready to switch media? Um, lately, I've been, been working um, doing a lot of painting and a lot of pen and ink drawings and uh, a woman right now has commissioned me to do a monotype so that's what I'm working on now. Excellent. But uh, like for Santa Fe Indian Market I'll do a monotype generally to put into their uh, competition. Uh, that's been a pretty important show for you over the years. Yeah I've been doing it 27 years and so uh, first starting out doing Santa Fe Market, I made $425. Which might not have been a bad amount 27 years ago. Uh, it wasn't a great amount. <laughs> for Santa Fe. For Santa Fe. For the expense of Santa Fe. <laughs> yeah, even then it was pretty expensive and it didn't even cover our expenses. So you have to kind of look at that and go, well, maybe I should try it again. And, and it's gotten better over the years and uh, the people that come to see me some of them are friends and some of them are collectors and they always want to know what I'm doing. So it's been great to, to visit, but not only with a lot of the artists that I only get to see out there at that time of the year, but also people. Right. How has your creative process changed over the years? Over the years, I think it uh, has become a lot more influenced by um, shapes. For instance, I'll take a, um, say, a cereal box container uh, or a uh, Coke container uh, and I'll tear it up to put it in the trash and as I'm tearing it up, the shape of it will remind me of something and so I'll save it and then I'll come back and, and uh, outline it on a piece of paper and then start to fill in that outline of what I think I saw. Yeah. 
So that's kind of inspiration from the most <clears throat> routine. It is, yeah. But uh, unexpected. Yeah, and, ex yeah I, and I think that's a great part of, of being creative, is you get these unexpected inspirations. Uh, you'll be walking out uh, on the highway or on the sidewalks and there'll be, say, a bird splatter, uh, some kind of little image that's been ground into the pavement and uh, you'll sketch it down. And I've, I've walked across the bridge in Chattanooga and saw some rusted uh, wood there and took a photograph and it looked like people having a conversation with each other. Were you in Chattanooga for a show or? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. <clears throat> First time I'd been there and so, uh, wasn't, wasn't a particularly great show, but at least it was an experience and met some good people and hung out with some fellow artists. And that, that does seem to be one of the really um, nice things about uh, being an artist is the travel. Yeah, um, uh, I think being able to go to different, different places, like I've been to Japan with my artwork. Oh, uh, can you talk about that a little? Um, several years ago, uh, the state of Oklahoma wanted some uh, miniatures, uh, and so I did four of them, and then I did a painting to present to the prefecture of Kyoto. Uh, they took over some dancers, and they took over some art from the uh, Cowboy uh, Hall of Fame at that time, and uh, then they showed my work along with them. And uh, we did a fundraiser here through my friend Robert Vincent and got enough to pay my way over there and my way back and put me up in a, a nice hotel. And since I wasn't a part really of the uh, uh, state, uh, I was able to be uh, on my own in the day and the night to go wherever I wanted to. So I would jump on their subway and I'd ride it to the end and then I'd jump off and maybe at two o'clock in the morning I'd make it make my way back to the hotel room. But I was out there photographing and sketching and just enjoying being in Japan because that's where I, it was one of my ambitions to go there. That's wonderful. Do you, I know you've both, you know, um, relied upon galleries to represent you and and dealt extensively with galleries, and you've also traveled to these kinds of shows. Do you think there are advantages or disadvantages to either route? Do you think a combination is the best for an artist? How do you feel about that? I think a combination is the best for an artist because if you don't work with uh, an outlet a gallery that uh, shows your work, uh, what are you doing with it? when you're not traveling to a show. Uh, if you store it in your house, no one's going to see it. Um, so if you have it on a gallery wall and you, uh, you don't always have to sell it to them, you can put it there on commission or consignment. And uh, then when you get ready to go do a show, you can pull it and take it to a show. It's, it, again, that's up to you in the gallery. That's however you want to work it with them. Um, it's, cons it's better to stay consistent on your prices if you're working with a gallery and if you're going to a show uh, because I think in the long run that will hurt you and uh, people will then go well I'm not going to buy it at the gallery because I can get it from him or her for a lot less than the gallery right. and uh, it's, a, it's an old concept um, here in Oklahoma especially that um, artists will sell their work for a lot less if they hit on hard times. Right, right. That's been an unfortunate, so. That's, it's been a struggle to convey to people that, that that's not the, yeah. yeah, that's not a good thing and that's not the way most artists do business. Every artist um, does have that, you know, sort of following of collectors and as you said then they sometimes become very good friends and then yeah. does, it, does it ever get complicated in terms of if they're still buying and they're also close friends and 
No, because I think there's a certain uh, amount of uh, collectors that you can have as friends and still sell them artwork and they will still be a collector. Uh, but again, that's, that's a, something between you and, and the person. Uh, there are other people that uh, you only see maybe once and they'll buy something from you and uh, then they'll disappear. But some of the people that have uh, supported you over the years and you feel a closeness to, I think that's a great feeling. It is a great feeling. What are some of the art awards that you're most proud of? Oh gosh, art awards that I'm most proud of. Uh, oh, one that comes to mind right away is the uh, Woody Crumbo Memorial Award that I received one year in Santa Fe. Um, I'd known Woody uh, from the beginnings of my art career um, in Tulsa, and he and I would discuss uh, marketing, and he had his concept of how I should approach it. And I appreciated his advice. Uh, then uh, being made a uh, Oklahoma treasure um, by a group here um, are two of the, the honors I can think of right off the bat. Those are great honors. Did you did you meet Woody at the art market or did you just meet him at Big I met at Big Woody Home? through Jim Halsey. Through Jim Halsey. Yeah, I, yes, because his daughter, uh, Woody's daughter's married to Jim. Mm -hmm. well, and and uh, Jim, again, was uh, promoting uh, Woody's work and right. taking it to places. And, and you have mentioned his art also as kind of an influence along with, you know, um, Will Kandinsky and Clay and Mon Mondrian and some of the um, abstract painters. Mm -hmm. I was wondering in what way um, Woody Crumbo's artwork had influenced you. Uh, I think just uh, looking at, uh, because you you look at his originals and you see a lot of texture in them. Uh, you see a lot of buildup of the paint. And uh, of course, I'm, like I say, <laughs> attracted to texture. <laughs> right. <laughs> what have been some of the other highlights of your career, your art career? Other highlights of my art career, uh, besides meeting the people that I have over the years, being able to travel to uh, uh, other countries, uh, being uh, um, honored by the various awards I've received over the years. Uh, I think that uh, being able to uh, help younger up-and-coming artists because I'm getting old. I'm getting to the age where I admired the people that when I first started and it's good to be out there in these various markets and to see what is being created and to see who is going to be shining as they continue their art careers and being able to uh, offer them advice or encourage them or to uh, maybe find a marketplace for their work. Um, that's probably been something that I uh, appreciated being able to do along with my wife Barbara and uh, then teaching uh, not only adults but kids and seeing how their minds work and seeing what they can produce and um, one time I was doing a uh, printmaking workshop in Tulsa and uh, one of my students had uh, put a blob of ink on a piece of paper and I looked at it and I said, wow, I can see an image in that. So I asked them <laughs> if I could have that blob of ink and they said, sure. <laughs> was that through the Philbrook Museum? No, or? this was this was a, a teacher's group <laughs> oh. that was there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> There was a, a couple of years where I did work for the Philbrook uh, Museum when they weren't as big as they were now, or are now, and uh, they had me working out in the teepee, and uh, I would talk to kids, and I would tell them a legend, 
Well, when I would tell them a legend, I did cartoons to emphasize <laughs> my legend. And so I could remember the legend as well. <laughs> And I remember one time I cooked a meal for them toward the end of the session, and I told them it was something that they they were very afraid to eat it. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. <laughs> how um, how do you define Oklahoma Indian art? How do I define Oklahoma Indian art? Uh, I I think we have uh, some very outstanding creative artists here in our state that are a lot of times are overlooked by our uh, fellow uh, Oklahoma staters and that when they travel out and they do these other markets they're discovered by uh, some Oklahoma collectors and brought back here. So it's sort of the um notion that they're just not recognized. <laughs> no, not a prophet in their own country, sort of. That's right. A lot of them you are not. You think that's and, a characteristic. And, uh, and a lot of the, I think people uh, see uh, bragging rights. Say, for, for instance, when they go to Santa Fe and they buy an Oklahoma artist's work out there, and then they bring it back and they say, oh, I bought this in Santa Fe. And they could have bought it here just as well, but it's, right. it's more romanticized then. Right, um, right. <laughs> but uh, looking at, at uh, fellow artists out there uh, and doing these various markets, that's why it's, it's important to always look around and see what's done. To, and some of it will influence you, and uh, some of your work will influence them, and that's always great to see. Nice synergy. In uh, 1990, the, the uh, Indian Arts and Crafts uh, Act, a newer version of it was passed, yeah. and um, it, it, as you know, it required um, the artists, you know, have proof of enrollment um, to call themselves Indian artists or be certified by their tribe. And I was wondering if you remembered kind of the impact that had on the Oklahoma Indian art scene. Well, having uh, been here in Oklahoma City and uh, worked with uh, some of the various uh, galleries uh, here at that time, uh, I think Imogene Mugg had her gallery going on. She was at the uh, um, fairgrounds for a number of years, and then right. she opened up her own gallery, and then Doris Littrell was here. So did you uh, show with Imogene, too? I did, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. She used to do her shows, and we'd all right. gather around and show there. <laughs> um, but we were, uh, I think, a, a close-knit uh, community of artists before they passed the Indian Arts and Crafts Law, as it was then. And uh, when they did that, it uh, created a lot of tension and a lot of... Uh, finger pointing at people that could finally come out and go, well, they're not truly an Indian artist. And it uh, hurt me to see that the friendships over the years that had been there all of a sudden disintegrated and uh, shows closed off to a lot of fine artists that um, Weren't, they weren't creating uh, Indian art because there was a profit in it. They were creating Indian art because that's who they truly were. That's who their people had told them, you're of Indian descent, although we can't prove it. And I think uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Law um, originally was um, created to stop the imitation that was coming into this country from overseas. And then it went awry and was used for a different purpose because we still have those imitations coming in. Yes, we do. <laughs> 
Well, I'd like to talk about something fun. We're getting ready to wind up here, but I know that you have a passion for garage sailing. Oh, <laughs> and I just wonder if you'd um, explain what, what it is you enjoy about that. Uh, what I enjoy about garage selling is, is uh, and I'll tell you what I'm looking for when I'm doing garage sales. <laughs> I'm looking for an old World War II film showing a movie star at a USO program. Why? <laughs> because they went over at, in the various wars, whether it was World War I, or World War II, or Vietnam, or Korean War, and uh, they would do these shows. You know, Bob Hope, when I was in Vietnam, was always there with these various people. That's and, uh, right. I think um, Anne Margaret was uh, an outstanding performer that really complimented and paid tribute to the veterans there. Um, but someone out there had to do a video, a film, <laughs> of one of the performances. Um, so, so they were really important to, <clears throat> to the morale. Oh, they were, yeah, definitely important. Um, but I, I uh, look at old photographs, and uh, I have a collection of uh, not only women in their period dresses with the flowing gowns and things, but uh, I look to see if there's Indian people in some of these photographs. And I picked up uh, uh, on one occasion a uh, slide presentation of the uh, celebration in Anadarko and uh, oh Indian Fair Indian Fair yeah wow and so I've got those and and uh, you know things that I can use whether it's a, a person or whether it's a landscape um, on a slide or in a photograph for my painting so that way I don't have to to use a book um, I can go to what I've got in my collection and uh, some of the people, uh, family photos that they no longer want. So, and then I find little things that are humorous <laughs> to me. <laughs> right. But, uh, and books. I'm always uh, collecting books. You know, when I was growing up on the farm, we didn't have a, a whole lot of books in the farmhouse. And uh, then the school library, uh, you know, you read the Hardy Boys, you read the Just So stories of how the animals did, got this way they did, and there weren't a lot of books on Indian people. And I collect those, looking for the older historical books to see how they were written and to see what we were uh, portrayed as. And right. in some instances, we're the brutal savage out there. And, we're the heathen, we're the, the person that uh, has no God. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the people that wrote those, and you're going, all oh, right, this is a terrible book, but yes. it's a part of, of history and how, how we were portrayed. That's true, and it makes you appreciate <laughs> the 60s, doesn't it? <laughs> the 60s <laughs> onward. Well, um, we are going to talk about a few of your pieces of artwork now, if that's okay. Okay, that'll be and fine. And I noticed that you've um, assembled part of the woodblock print. We can start with that. On this, this woodblock print, um, what you can see here, this is, uh, and I don't know how well you can see it, but this is the key block to this print. And uh, it's called a key block because everything else will fit within this block here. Uh, it's a, a more than an eight color woodcut. And when you draw it out and you put it onto your wood, you have to flip it so that when you get ready to print it, it comes out the way you had drawn it and imagined it to be. So all of these are um, colors that will fit into this particular block and produce this print. And so each of them, I can. Uh, because of the um, distance, I can print three colors at a time in some of my blocks instead of having to cut three different blocks. That's really neat. And that's done on the mahogany grain plywood uh, 
piece of wood. Uh, sometimes I'll use uh, poplar, which will hold a really nice line. And they're, I take it, pretty easy to work with, but they still hold the line. They do. Uh, um, this one, because it's a, a plywood, you don't have to cut real far. And uh, once you cut down below the surface, because it's all surface printing, then uh, you can take a chisel point and knock out a lot of the wood that's there. This piece is called the Spirit Gatherer. And what it is, it's a woman collecting the spirits, and the spirits are represented by these little balls of light all across the uh, landscape. And the birds are the ones that are coming to try and get the spirits before the woman collects them and puts them in her apron. But this is a pen and ink with watercolor. It's one of my favorites. Yes. And it's one you kept in your personal collection. Yes. Um, when um, I talked to uh, some of the earlier uh, artists here in Oklahoma, and uh, when the end of their life came, they had nothing of theirs in their family um, that they kept because they were trying to make a living and they were selling everything that they produced. And I made it a point that I would allow some of my work to be out on the market so long that if it didn't sell, then it would end up on our wall and in our collection and would never be sold. That's so important. Okay, and this one is, uh, it's called My Daddy's House. And uh, I told people that uh, if I ever sold it, I could buy my daddy a house with it. And that's why I titled it My Daddy's House. But it's a, a piece that was um, created for um, an organization out of Washington, D.C. one year. And it's the four directions and it's four cultures. Uh, the red circle represents continuing life and remains unbroken. The hands represent communication and friendship. The trees represent the rainforest of the earth. The half mounds represent the earth. The bird coming from the center, flying out, represents prayer to the Creator. And this is just decoration to make it vibrate on the eye because before I closed in these circles, it had a lot of movement to it. But once I closed those circles in, then it made it very static. So then I went back and added this design. It's wonderful, wonderful piece. And that's gouache on Yeah, this board. is gouache on watercolor paper. On watercolor paper.